Okay, thank you for paying attention to the video and at least coming to watch the few seconds at minimum if you're hearing this. Uh, I'm going to go over two uh, somewhat interesting example problems that are a bit different than what we've gone over in class just to help you reinforce concepts. And I think since uh, you've been kind enough to actually pull up the lecture video, we'll call it at two. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next class period. So uh, I'm doing this on a surface, the surface I use in class. So pardon me as you hear a bunch of uh, tapping noises. That's simply just me writing. I wanted this uh, to do it this way so you can actually see um, things appear. So the first problem is 225. And I picked it because it's, it's rather interesting. It's, it's basically a manometer problem, but in a very non-traditional fashion. Uh, an air-filled hemispherical shell. So basically like you think of some sort of sea lab. Uh, some sort of uh, environment for humans down on this ocean floor. It's it's uh, at a depth of 10 meters, so not terribly deep, but deep enough you would um, you would not want to stay down there, even scuba with scuba gear, too terribly long, as shown in the adjoining figure. A mercury barometer located inside the shell reads 765 millimeters of mercury. Now keep in mind this is a barometer, so that's that's the device that, in its most basic form, just has a pail of liquid mercury an inverted test tube put into it. So you have different fluid heights, and you essentially end up with, with uh, mercury vapor in the top, which is terrifying to think of, but thankfully it stays there because you actually hit the vapor pressure of mercury at the top of that column. Uh, you hit a near vacuum. So um, that instrument is located inside of this lab space and indicates a pressure inside of... 765 millimeters of mercury. Now, keep in mind that this is technically a unit of height. Pressure interior equals 765 mm mmHg, atomic symbol for mercury. But even though it's a unit of height, we know underneath, given the specific weight of mercury, you can translate that to a pressure, so it's very common for instruments to get that reading. Uh, Additionally, through the problem, a mercury YouTube manometer, as depicted in the problem, designed to give the outside water pressure, indicates a differential reading of 735 mm mmHg. So again, they give you a height displacement, which we know, uh, based on what we know about fluids, is really a pressure. Based on these data, what is the atmospheric pressure at the ocean surface? So that's kind of interesting that you, and I hadn't really ever considered thinking about that you could tell the atmospheric pressure of a fluid, you know, 10 meters above you. If you're underneath the water, you can, with sensors, determine what the pressure is way above you. It makes absolute sense once you consider it in your mind, but I guess I just don't spend much time 10 meters beneath the water. So this really is just a hydrostatic problem combined with uh, a little bit of manometers. So we basically start summing up from our known condition, or the one we want to find in this case. So we'll say pressure of the atmosphere, and then we start adding pressures until we get to the interior pressure of the sea lab environment, because we know that pressure. It's given to us as 765 mmHg. We can convert that when we need it. So if you start at uh, this location, we'll call it you know, location one, the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure plus the specific weight of seawater, which is a bit different than water itself, uh, and we have 10 meters of depth. So that's, again, just gamma H gives you a pressure there. Notice that 10 meters is not all the way to the base of the ocean. It's to the opening for this manometer in the seawall. And then plus we will have another uh, depth of seawater. So gamma seawater, that's the fluid we're dealing with, times 0 0.3, oops, cannot write, 360 meters. And that is the additional drop in height from the opening of that manometer tube down to the mercury liquid level height. And in all these cases, we've been adding pressure because we're increasing in depth. And now with the mercury uh, manometer attached to the wall, we will be subtracting pressure at it because the mercury column is actually going up. Uh, so gamma mercury times 0 0.735 meters equals, so now we're at the top of that mercury manometer right there and that will equal equal pressure interior 
let's figure out what that pressure on the interior is. If you have a mercury barometer, the P interior is equivalent to the height given, which was 7, or I should say 0.765 meters times gamma M, which gamma M is 133 kilonewtons per meter cubed. Quite heavy. Uh, those values, again, are in the opening, the front cover of your textbook, if you need to consult where they came from. So this combined pressure, if I can uh, type that out, would be 101.745 pascals. Okay, so that was the interior pressure. So now we can actually go through the manometer, the rest of the manometer problem, and get rid of the only unknown variable, which to this point had been P interior. We now have a number for that. The rest of these uh, numbers, like specific weight of mercury, specific weight of seawater, can be looked up in tables. So if we take, and I'll just erase all the rest of this for a moment. Uh, Maximum surface sure is nice for this. They should uh, pay me to promote them by using them in class. Because now I can just take that bit and move it. Okay. Um, get rid of all that. We can just plug in some values. So gamma mercury. Also just erase that. Gamma of seawater is equivalent to... I can look this up real quick. 10.1. That makes sense because we would expect mercury to be massively more dense than seawater. So if we simply plug in those variables where they are not given at the moment, P interior being replaced with 101 or 745. You come to find that the variable P atmospheric solves for 94.9 kilopascals. So you are able to regress knowing the ocean is constant density, knowing you have a constant pressure drop as you go up in height. By knowing the exact pressure at the opening of the manometer, even in your underwater lab, you can measure the heights at the different levels of fluids, and take it all the way up to the ocean surface and figure out what the atmospheric pressure on the ocean surface is at that moment. That means you could put an autonomous sensor, put some sort of a buoy on the ocean floor, so it's protected from weather, it's protected from elements, and still track atmospheric pressure uh, and things happening above you. So it's a pretty interesting problem, I thought. Uh, just not that the math is difficult or anything curious, but just the application was uh, very non-typical. So that's one problem. Uh, the other example problem I have is 266. And, and this deals, again, kind of with the same concepts of partitioning a solid fluid into fluid static elements, determining the weights and forces that act at arbitrary boundaries, and kind of the unknown boundary surface type problem. So an open tank containing water has a bulge in its vertical side that is semicircular in shape, and shown in P266. I suppose you could read, but whatever. We'll read this to you. Determine the horizontal and vertical components of the force that the water exerts on the bulge. Base your analysis on the one foot length of the bulge. So it's only one foot deep into the, uh, the drawing here. However, it has a radius of three feet. So, right. It's not terribly deep. One foot. Okay, as, as you might suspect, we are going to divide this in an arbitrary boundary uh, right there, just containing the fluid that is in the bulge itself. The weight of the fluid in that region is the specific weight of water. In fact, instead of using W, I'll take a book suggestion, call it specific weight of H2O, uh, multiplied by the volume inside of that region. So this is uh, a simple calculation going forward. So 62.4 pounds force per foot cubed times the equation for volume, which in our case will just be pi times radius 
squared divided by two, multiplying all that by the one foot depth, which makes it quite easy to find that the total weight is 882 pounds force on that region of fluid. Uh, curiously enough, that's already one of the answers. The other force of consideration, so that is from the centroid of this object, there'll be a weight vector pulling it straight down. The other force will, of course, be the pressure that starts at zero at the fluid surface and is increasing linearly with depth. It pushes against the lower portions of the wall, the upper portions of the wall, all equal. It will also push against our virtual wall that I've drawn there. So, to calculate the magnitude of the force, thankfully this doesn't even ask us the location, it just wants the magnitude of the, of the force there, so we only have to be concerned with centroidal height. You don't have to mess with inertias, you don't have to mess with anything else. And it's also important to understand that the cross section we're concerned with at that boundary is not a circle, it is the, if I can choose a different color, the rectangular shape of the boundary uh, as it comes between the bulge and the rest of the water volume. So perhaps I can just undo those additions to clean up the drawing again. Cool. Let's conclude by using the simple formula from the notes, which all come from the text anyway, that the force, in this case, the horizontal force against the bulge virtual wall will be specific weight of H2O multiplied by the height of the centroid beneath the fluid surface uh, multiplied by the area this uh, average pressure is acting across. So thankfully this becomes a very simple uh, equation to keep filling out. So we can proceed just by saying 62.4 pounds force per foot cubed multiplied by central height beneath water. So you have a six feet that you initially go down. Um, let's clean this up a little. There's all that. Just get rid of everything. Plus the additional three foot radius to the center of the circle. So you go nine feet down to the centroid of that, again, the virtual wall that we're dealing with here as that, uh, as that bulge is only one foot deep into the page. So nine feet down from the surface multiplied by a total height of six feet and one foot deep. So that would be six square feet of area. Okay. After some high-level math, this all works out to be 3,370 pounds force. So the question asks, and this is kind of one of the, I wouldn't call it, it is a gotcha, I guess. Um, determine the horizontal and vertical components of the force that the water exult, or exerts on the bulge, not that the bulge in the wall exerts on the water. So it's important that the horizontal force of 3,370 pounds, the water is trying to force the bulge out to the right. The weight, the water is weighing down in that region because uh, that's the direction gravity works. So again, not a complicated problem, but I just did these to reinforce perhaps some uh, easier concepts and show that the setup is really what matters. Uh, I saw students time and time again last semester uh, not know what matters in a problem, what doesn't, not know how to set up a problem because they relied too heavily on solutions. So please do study the different kinds of problems, work through a few, you see most of them are very, very, very simple. Uh, and they're really the same problem, just posed in slightly different ways. So I hope this, uh, this shorter lesson is acceptable for you. I, I, I hope you go use the extra time to, I'm sure, study your fluids textbook. I'm sure that's exactly what you're going to go do. Anyway, uh, I wanted to give you some benefit on this day where I regretfully had to miss teaching uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys again. Uh, I suppose it'll be Tuesday. See you then. Goodbye.